Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, I am Ishar Kandaratn, Head of Engineering in WSO2 Identity Server. So if I tell you a bit about uh, WSO2, we are an integration company. Uh, we have two main focus. One is integration and the other is identity and access management. Uh, for the integration, we have two main products. Uh, one is uh, WSO2 API Manager and we have uh, Corio, which is uh, integration platform in cloud. Uh, for the identity and access management, we have WSO2 uh, identity server, and we have built uh, several solutions using this uh, product. One is WS2 open banking solution, and the other one is uh, open healthcare solution. And if I tell you a bit about myself, uh, I've been working in WS2 for more than 10 years, mainly in WS2 Identity Server. Uh, apart from the development activities, I involved with the, the, the customer engagement. So I help uh, customers around the world to uh, implement their identity and access management solutions and the API management solutions, uh, especially the API security related stuff. So this is a bit about me. Uh, let's go and see what we are going to discuss in this session today. Uh, okay, so in this session, uh, I'm going to discuss about uh, the high level uh, API secret architecture. Then let's see what is important in uh, authentication and authorization when it comes to the API security, especially how we do the access this control uh, via authentication and API secret, uh, authorization. Then I'll uh, discuss about the, uh, the best practices uh, when implementing authentication and authorization into uh, your API security uh, architecture. Then I'll do uh, several demos on uh, these best practices using WSO2 Identity Server. Uh, the product that uh, I'm currently working on. So if I tell you a bit about Identity Server, in Identity Server, uh, we provide, that's an on-premise on uh, identity and access management solution. And we are specialized in uh, user management, identity management, uh, identity federation, provisioning, strong authentication, uh, adaptive authentication, and uh, privacy management. So these are the kind of uh, main focus areas. And then WC Identity Server work as a uh, default uh, authorization server to the WC2 API management solution. Okay. Uh, if I discuss about the, the, the high level API security architecture, you can see we have uh, the, the APIs that we have implemented. So in most of the cases, these are exposed via API gateway. So the, this API gateway will convert this existing normal APIs into the managed API. Then we have identity and access management component, uh, which handle the, the security tokens, the identities in the systems and everything. Uh, then we uh, access these API, APIs through firewalls. It can be the TCP firewall or web application firewall, which uh, we use to uh, protect these system against uh, DDoS attacks. Uh, let's say we enforce uh, rate limiting and so on uh, within this layer. And then of course we have the applications that we use to uh, invoke these APIs. So if we have a more closer look, in the application side, we can see different types of application. They can be web application. So most of the business logic run in the back end uh, service. And then we have mobile applications where uh, the application is running in the mobile device. Then we have single page application. The business logic mostly running in the uh, browser and invoke the backend services via APIs to get the data. Then we have devices where we have very limited uh, input capabilities, uh, sometimes like uh, music players and so on. Then we have services, those services may not have 
the input capabilities even like devices and again based on the ability we can securely keep the access token we divide again these application as uh, public uh, applications and confidential application and again when we go into the the api side some apis uh, talk to other apis kind of api chain and some apis are implemented as microservices so we have to uh, think about the sidecars service meshes uh, ingress and open policy agents how enforce uh, policies some apis are directly accessing the service it can be the database or some other service so so when we trying to implement the the api security into this platform we can't just define a one solution right we have to think about each of these component what are the the application types that going to invoke these apis what are the devices how we have implemented these apis if it is kind of api chaining scenario how we let's say pass this authentication information the user information to the other apis as well right so so we have to think lots of aspects when we build this whole solution right so let's go to the the o2.0 framework so this is the kind of de facto standard that we are going to that we are using uh, to secure the api so the handle the access delegation in the api security world so even in the o2.0 framework it has several the different flows where we can get the access and use it right so if you go through these uh, the grant types we say we can identify based on different applications based on different implementations based on different devices we use different different flows when we introduced the o2.0 protocol initially there were four main grant types right the authorization code client credential implicit and the password grant type. so authorization code grant was recommended for the grant was recommended for the web application then the client credential uh was especially designed for the web application where just call the service call and service to service communication and the implicit flow was uh, for the the single page application and the password grant initially used for the native application with the the recent security considerations and so on this implicit flow and the the password grant is not that much recommended instead uh this authorization code flow with uh, a pixie extension is used for uh, those application type but still due to some limitation maybe in the application side or so on, we still have to use uh, this implicit and password grant grant some up to some extent too for example if you are the native browser is not that sophisticated and it is not user friendly still people have to use password grant type for the native application then there's device authorization grant which is introduced for the 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 device based applications and uh, jwt and saml br grant types you can use if you have if you already have a security token if it is a jwt or a saml you can exchange these token to get a new token then with the the mutual uh, tls authentication it it help to bind the security token into client credentials and token exchange will help to exchange these uh, security tokens you have uh, with imp impersonation or with delegation so these are the different types of what to flows and how you can use these stuff based on the application or uh, the way the device and the way that has implemented so when we think about the overall api security architecture we can see some of the attacks or some some of the security enforcement we are done via uh, threat protection mechanism and some stuff are enforced via access control 
So if you go and see the the top ten or OAS top ten uh, API security vulnerabilities, you can see some are mitigated with threat protection, some are mitigation the, the access control to mitigate some stuff. We have to use the both. So in this session, <clears throat> we are going to mainly focus on the the access control or the authentication and the authorization aspects in a API security. So what is the big deal of uh, this access control? Why we need it? Right? You know, uh, starting 2020, we have to face the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So millions of employees, we had to, we had to go to working from home mode and start working remotely. Even now, we are working, most of the time we are working in home, right? During that reason, many business, they were forced to adopt uh, this digitalization. If you think about, the, let's say, a shopping mall, if they can't do the online delivery, either they have to go away from the business, if not, they have to implement it. Another thing we can see, since uh, organizations rush to implement these solutions, right, they may didn't follow these best practices, right? Due to these reasons, we can see different attacks has happened on these API. So I, I took this information from uh, 20, 20Q1 uh, data breach quick peep report from risk-based security. Right? They say uh, around 8.4 billion records were exposed only in the first quarter of 2020. And if they compare it uh, with the 2019, this is kind of a 273% code, right? The interesting fact is 70% of these things will happen due to uh, unauthorized access, right? So that's why this access control is very important when it comes to uh, our platform. Right? When we're implementing an API security platform, we want people to in, uh, access these APIs and uh, build using these APIs. So it is very important to make sure that we have implemented correct authorization uh, policies, authorization mechanisms into our system. When we implementing a system, it, it is kind of common knowledge that, that the, the, the strength of the whole system, it is not going beyond the weakest link in your system, right? The, the strength of your whole platform is equal to the strength of the weakest system, right? So in that case, when we implementing this whole the API security platform, we should make sure that identity and access management component is not going to be the weakest link. And again, when we think about our API platforms, right, we are not going to implement this from the scratch, right? We can't do it because already there can be, we have users, they are in the organization user stores, already we are using application, we have data there, so due to this reason, we can't, it's rare that we can build from the scratch. We have to use this existing system, right? So we have to use the existing user stores. We have to use the existing authentication mechanism, right? And again, we are not implementing this API platform for a single application, single API or two API, maybe hundreds API, thousands API, right? The whole system, should scale, right? So then when you implement the, this whole system, we have to think about security, how we going to make sure that that whole system is secure. Right? Then we have to think about the, the usability, right? If it is not usable, people, they won't come and use it, right? So if we have in, enforced maximum security, it may not that user friendly. Right? To avoid that thing, we may be collecting more and more users' information and, and we will try to provide a personalized experience. Right? 
when we try to implement a personalized experience then again we have to face with the privacy concern right in due to this reason we have to balance these aspects as well when especially when we implementing a uh, identity and access management into your api platform okay then uh, when you think about our api platform right so there are multiple applications or the device they will invoke this api right but in any of these invocation behind this invocation or behind this application there are some sort of identity it can be a person it can be a device or it can be an application but but we have to manage these identities in our platform so identity management is uh, another key area in our platform right so from beginning i said we have to deal with the existing platform we have to implement our new system on top of the existing platform in that case definitely we have to use the existing user space right in the organization uh, you may be already using an active directory user space maybe you have another database where you keep the uh, your employees information sometimes it can be a ldap right so we have to think how we connect all these uh, user stores into our platform and implement our new api security solution and if you are using a different uh, user stores maybe there's a reason sometimes these users may differ for example the way you treat the employees is somewhat different to uh, your consumer then we can see clearly two user types if the user types are different if the user stores are different definitely we may be maintaining different user schemas for different users right and again if all things are different the the workflow that we use to onboard the users into the system definitely that is going to also be change right so when we implement the identity in identity in your platform identity management we have to think all these aspect right and again we have to worry about how easily we onboard users into the system how we let them to change their credentials right if they forget their complete account how we let them to recover it especially if they want to go away from the system if they request how we are going to remove their account and the related information when it comes to privacy this is a main concern right so those are small small elements but we have to think these aspects when we are implementing a identity into the system right so in the beginning we may not encounter all these aspect right but if we want to grow and scale our system we have to think all these aspect so it's it's good if we can find that kind of solution from the beginning and uh, integrate it to the system so in future you may not have to worry those aspects so when we implementing uh, let's say the api management platform so i have seen this most of the time with our customers i have worked to so most of the time we worry about how we secure our security token access token right how we maintain maintain the the token lifetime we we worry about all these aspects but sometimes we forget about how people or the application get these tokens right to get these tokens we have to authenticate into the identity provider and get this token so if this authentication is not a strong one if we haven't enforced the correct authentication mechanisms it doesn't matter how securely we keep the access token in our application if some unauthorized person if they can get the token they will definitely access the the application the data and everything uh in 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 that way right so in that case it is equally important how we enforce the authentication in this platform 
when it comes to the authentication it says the the still this username and password based authentication mechanism is the most common authentication mechanism still in the world okay so i i did a quick search in the internet so these are kind of in the steps i got right yeah. it says around 60% of the people reuse the password across multiple sites right the scary thing is 13% of the people use the same password across all the accounts and devices right you know all the applications on all the devices they don't implement the security or give the priority to the security aspect equal right there can be applications which doesn't manage the passwords or credentials properly in that case if any of these application if they expose our credentials the attackers they can easily access all the other applications it's, it doesn't matter how securely uh, they manage the, the they store the data uh, how securely they enforce the other procedures the, the attackers will simply access the system especially it says 48% of the workers they are using the same password for both work account and the personal account right so so it is not something good but but this is the reality right so since this is the truth we have to ac- accept it and when we think about our sol- solution we have to consider all the aspects and we need to identify how to mitigate this right when it comes to the password related stuff uh, the strong authentication or the multi factor authentication has become the solution for these password related issues right with the the multi factor authentication we are providing multiple layers of authentication right so in that case we are trying to ensure that even the attacker break a one layer it's very hard for them to break the second layer and it will ensure that attacker will not uh, enter the target breaking the all the level right uh, to implement this multi factor authentication <clears throat> we think about several factors or we say several authentication mechanism there are three main groups right the first we say as the the knowledge factor uh knowledge factor means something you know it can be a password it can be a pin number it can be another secret and so on. then the second factor is the possession factor which means something you have uh something like your phone uh the smart card fido device like that then the third factor is the inherent factor which means something you are your fingerprint your facial features your voice so these can be used as another authentication mechanism so we can use two or more of these factors and build a layer defense for your authentication so it will ensure that the 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 let's say attackers no, not going to easily uh, authenticate to your account and try to access these things and you see when we implement this kind of authentication mechanisms it is not always user friendly right for example let's say if we implement uh, the first fact as a first factor uh, password username and the password for the second factor we implement the sms based authentication so if this is a static authentication chain always we try to access the system we have to use the username and password and wait till we get the sms and authenticate with it so this is not that much useful thing so some years back i i checked the the google authentication stack so they they had been forced the they have implemented they had implemented the second factor on that occasion but the number said around 90% of the people they didn't use the strong authentication at that time because they felt that it is not that user friendly instead they just went with the 
use an MND fast file. So you can see, even if we have implemented a strong authentication mechanism, strong security enforcement in the system, if those are not that user friendly, people are not going to use it, right? If they are not going to use it, it's useless implementing those things, right? Now we are facing an issue, how we implement a strong authentication mechanism at the same time, how we balance the usability, right? To address these concerns, there's another concept called the adaptive authentication. We are, we are trying to uh, provide the authentication mechanisms evaluating the uh, user's current context and balance the security and the convenience, right? So this uh, adaptive authentication is not a complete new authentication mechanism. What we do here, we evaluate the context information. For example, what is your geolocation? Are you accessing the system? Uh, in your default location, is it your office or your home or is it a different place? Right? You might have seen when you travel to some other countries and when you try to access, sometimes some applications enforce different authentication methods. And what is the device that you are going to access, especially if you are going to access a Gmail with a new browser or new device, they definitely ask whether you are going to access the system with the new devices and so on, right? We can consider this aspect. What's our current role? What is the risk associated with this login? For example, let's say, if you are going to do a one or two dollar transaction, it's not that risky, but you are going to do a thousand of dollars transaction, then it is risky, right? So we can gather this information and based on this risk, and then the locations and everything, we can orchestrate the authentication mechanisms. For example, if you are going to do a one or two dollar transaction, we just let the users to log in your username and password. Right? If it is a risky thing, if it is a thousand dollar transaction, yes, then we enforce, uh, let's say SMS based authentication or TOTP based authentication. In that case, definitely the consumers or the users, they will use it because they also feel the risk at that time. So then they would be very happy to use uh, this authentication mechanism as well. So this is the advantage we are getting with the adaptive authentication. So let me do uh, these uh, authentication mechanisms and how we can implement those things with the WS identity server and how we can incorporate this into the uh, your API security platform, right? So let me quickly go to my demo. Uh, for this demo, I'm going to use the WS2 identity server. Uh, if you go to the WSO2.com site, you can uh, go to the identity server page so you can download it as a zip file or there are different installers you can get one of these right so i have uh, set up my ws2 identity server instance locally and i'm using a playground application so I, i'm not going to do much in the application side here i'm just trying to uh, get a token with a uh, let's say the authorization code grant type. And, and in that flow, I want to show you how to enforce uh, different authentication mechanisms. Uh, first, let's go to the identity server. Here, I'm going to use temporary admin credentials, but if you are using the identity server in production system, you can easily uh, change this uh, admin credentials. So, First of all, if we want to log into or get a token for another application, we have to configure that application within the identity server. To do that, you can go to the service provider section and click add. I would say 
example application then i can give a description and i can click register and then give other information so the protocol related information is available in the inbound authentication configuration section so you can select the auth and open id connect for this case and register so i am not going to use it i have already configured the application so i'm going to use it uh, this is the playground application i am going to use if we go inside you can see under the inbound authentication configuration or then open id connect configuration i have configured my application here you can see uh, the common uh, for grant type and other extended grant types that we support can see some to bear iw and tlm grant type and jw to bear and so on so in, in wso to ident server we have the capability to build your own uh, grant type as a connector and plug it here too and if you go down you can see other stuff too whether to enable pixie the token expiry times token types whether it is jwt or bear uh, default grant type and so on so you can configure these things too so i'm not going to uh, change this configuration let me go and show you the user management stuff too so with the wso to ident server you can configure by default you have the capability to configure uh, ldap uh, user store in a read write mode or read only mode active directory user store and uh, jdpc user store again if you are using a different user schema or different user store type you can write your own user store connector and plug it into the system and again with wso to ident server you can connect multiple user stores uh, at the same time to the server so uh, identity server expose all the user stores as a single uh, user base to the outside uh, let me go and show you the the current users i am going to use in if you go to the users and roles section you can add new users and manage users let me list the available users <coughs> Here I am going to use the user Ishara and the user Mark. So if I show you the Ishara's role, you can see there uh, Ishara is in the admin role. And if I go to the Mark, Mark is only the consumer role. So in, in later in these demos, uh, I'll be using these accounts. Okay. Uh, let's go to my application again playground application because i want to get the consume can secret for the application okay uh, okay another thing so for these applications if you want to configure the authentication you have to go to the local and outbound authentication configuration and here you can configure uh, in the first case, I am going to use the default authentication mechanism, which is uh, username and the password. Let me get the consumer key. I'll go to the playground application. I paste the key. I use view as the option. I'm not going to use the open ID connect. I click the authorization. I should be redirect to WS identity server. I'll use my one of the user, let's say Shara. You can see I just authenticate with the username and password and access here. I have to give my consent to the permission I requested. Okay. Here I got the authorization code. I can simply get the access token too. Okay, I got the access token too. So in next cases, I am not going to do this uh invocation we are I'll just show the authentication piece so now you guys can see i i have got the access token just enforcing the username and password we discussed that it is not that secure now we want to implement 
uh, the strong authentication into the system, right? So in this demo, I'm going to in, uh, configure the username and password as the first step authentication. For the second step, I'm going to enforce uh, TOTP authentication. Let's see how we can do that with WS2 Identity Server. So we have to come to the service provider section. I have to go to the advanced section. Here we can configure multiple steps. For the first step, I'll just use my basic authentication. I'll add another step. For the second step, I am going to use TOTP authentication. Let's Okay, I, I haven't added the TOT authenticator. Yes, now let me save it. I update it. Okay. Go to the playground application. I'll copy the consumer key. I'll go to a new browser. I'll access the API. I'll Consumer key, scope view. Okay. In this case, first I authenticate with the username and the password. Let's see in the second step. Yes, as a second step, I have to give the TOTP code. Let me get the code. Okay, now I have to give my consent and I can get the authorization code. In the second call, I can get the access token too. So you can see in this case, uh, I have configured the TOTP authentication for all the users. So in this case, if I get try to get token, all the users, they have to uh, use uh, second fact authentication, which is TOTP. Few minutes back we discussed this is also not i mean this is secure but this is not that use of any how we implementing the adaptive authentication capabilities based on the context it should change right so with the wso2 identity server we can do that as well i'm pretty sure all the most of the other identity providers also do support this thing so with wso2 identity server you have the capability to write the adaptive uh, uh, authentication functionality as a script or by default we have given set of templates you can use one of these templates very easily uh, in this demo purpose i'm going to use a template where based on the role i decide whether to enforce the second fact authentication or not right so in this demo uh, i'm going to implement a role where if user is in the admin role, I think this is kind of, he can do in critical operations. Due to that reason, I enforce uh, the second fact authentication. If you are just a consumer, I'm letting you to access the system with the username and password based authentication. So with the templates, I will use a role based template. I'll add it. So it is for the admins and the manager. So in my case, it is only the admin. Uh, update it. Okay, let me check the other options too. Here, I'm not going to use the FIDO, I remove it. For the first step, uh, the username and password. For the second step, it is the TOTP, but I have uh, written written a rule where I enforce uh, the second factor only if the, the initial user, the user who authenticated with the username and password is within the admin role. Okay. Let's try. Go to a new browser. Version code. 
let's say edit now i am first trying to authenticate with the user mark if you can remember mark was a consumer he didn't have uh, admin role so in this case you can see mark only authenticated with the username and password in the second step he can give his consent and uh, try to get the access token but if you go to the other user for example ishara he is admin he should authenticate with both the username and the password let's try that as well with another new browser um trying to get the token this time okay i'll authenticate with the shadow yes you can see now i have to authenticate with totp let me get a new code and authenticate now i can do my consent now you can see here only the the user in the admin role had to authenticate with the second factor authentication likewise you can define different policies and then define uh, adaptive authentication if i go back and show you these two users and their role you can see the ishara he was the admin so he is in the admin role if i go to the mark mark is just a consumer so that's why as per our logic uh, mark has to authenticate only with the username and password ishar had to authenticate with the both username and password and again uh, with the totp authentication likewise when you design your system Uh, based on the context i'm with the application the severity of the application the severity of the data you can decide what kind of authentication mechanism i am going to use is it just the username and password do i need to use the strong authentication if i am going to use the strong authentication should i implement the adaptive authentication mechanisms too especially if this platform is for the the external developers or the consumers definitely you should think about the adaptive authentication aspect and try to implement but if it is something internally maybe you can just go with the uh, strong uh, authentication only okay uh, that is for that demo let's go to the next section right so when we develop a api platform we want people to use it especially we want developers to come to this platform and invoke these apis and build applications on top of these apis right which means we want let developers to easily access this system so most of the developers these days they definitely have a linkedin account or facebook it can be a twitter so if we can let them to use one of these accounts maybe the github credentials it's a kind of very easy journey for them to onboard this platform right so having more developer community around our platform kind of indication of the success of our platform too so in that case it's better if we can implement these kind of authentication mechanism in the system and again how business grows to it right most of the time it grow with acquisition and mergers if not when business is growing there are more and more acquisitions and mergers too right so if the acquisition is done how long will it take you to onboard the uh, the other organization how long will it take to onboard these uh, consumers belong to other organization if it takes months it is not going to use right in that case again this uh, federated access help so we can let uh, those developers or those uh, users 
to access our system in the uh, federated authentication mechanism right so when it comes to the apis there are two main ways we can implement this thing so the application uh, can trust uh, one identity provider the api gateway may use a trust uh, another identity provider so in this mode we can establish a trust relationship between let's say in this example the foo im solution and the bar im solution so the the users let's say now the user in a foo im trying to access this application so as usual he will go to the foo identity access management solution and get the token if, if let's say in this case it's a jwt or a saml then we exchange that token with the uh, bar identity access management solution using uh, saml bar or jwt bar grant type now they can easily access the api gateway without knowing any complexities and another way we can implement <coughs> this with the identity federation right in this case the application or the gateway or the api <coughs> they don't aware of any of these things but in the identity action management component side we implement the identity federation right so we configure uh, the social identity providers or the external identity provider to the single identity provider that identity provider will handle all the other authentication now the advantage we get is even if we want to onboard a new identity provider we can easily do it. and again let's say we want to enforce another strong authentication for these federated identities we can do it no? with our central identity provider right so those are the kind of advantages we are getting this method let me do a, a demo for this scenario too if i go to go back to my application with the identity server you can configure the different federated authentication mechanism if you go to the identity provider section you can add simply a federated identity provider either with the the default of the uh, identity federation protocol such as saml open id connect and so on if not there are connectors for google facebook and so on you can use these connectors by default there are only few but if you go to our connectors too you can see number of uh, strong authentication mechanisms so identity provider related connectors you can use those things and configure so here also i have configured google as identity provider here if i just go in i can show you a couple of configuration you can see i have given all the configurations here and i and i have configured the google okay if i go to the service provider section in my playground sample my i have go to inbound local and outbound authentication configurations i go to the advanced section now i'm not going to use this adaptive authentication script not even second factor but in the first step I'll use the username and password based authentication or the Google authentication. So I configure it, update it. Let me try to get a token with the Google user. Code I'm going to use say Viv. authorized here you can see i have two options in the first uh, option is the username and password based authentication or i can use uh, google authentication so i am going to use the google it redirects me to the google okay let me change the language and not 
authenticate okay i have forget my password let me remember the password for this account Let me quickly get it. Okay, let me okay, no. okay, let me give the password. Um, yes. I'm using a private browser due to that reason Google asked me to go for the second fact authentication phase. Yes. Accept it. Yes, you can see now uh, it asks me to give the consent for API access. So you can see I got the authorization code. In this case, I didn't authenticate with the user in my IAM solution. Instead, I directly went to the Google and authenticate there. And with that authentication information, I could get an access token. So this is how you can implement uh, federated authentication via uh, WSO2 identity server. Okay. Uh, if I continue the next section, so we discuss about the how to manage uh, the user identities within the system and we authenticate the system. So these two are still not enough. Right. So even if we identify the users correctly, their capabilities within the system may differ. Right. So authorization define their capabilities within the system. What kind of data they can access, what kind of APIs they can request, even within the APIs, what are the operations that can they can do. So in that case, the authorization is really important. When it comes to the or two dot framework, we use O2 uh, two scopes to manage this authorization, right? So the authorization, the scopes, we have to do the authorization mainly in two levels, right? When we issue a token for a given scope, we have to check whether uh, these scopes are aligned with the user's capabilities. If it is not aligned, we are not going to issue those scopes for given particular user. At the same time, when we try to invoke these APIs within the given access token, again, we have to validate whether these uh, scopes are allowed to access these resources. In both ways, we can evaluate it. And again, uh, in our framework, there are two drafts related to the authorization. One is a rich authorization request draft where uh, in this case, within with the request, the the application can request more uh, access uh, level. Right? And again, with the incremental authorization, uh, you know, most of the time, with the initial authorization grant, we try to get a token for all the scopes, right? But but it is kind of risky. With this new draft, what it trying to do is, uh, it trying to implement a mechanism where we first get the, the, the token for a minimum scope we need. And going on, if we want more scopes, we incrementally get those scopes for the tokens. But still these two are in the draft uh, uh, state, but in the future we can expect these two 
within the <coughs> O2.0 framework. So if I come back to the identity uh, management solution, uh, when we validate the scopes, we can uh, go beyond with the simple authorization. Some, most of the time we use the, uh, the role-based uh, uh, access control mechanisms to check whether we can issue the, 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 the given scopes, token for the, the requested scopes. But most of the identity providers may have more fine grain uh, authorization validation policies. For example, you can use SACMAN or the, the open policy engine for this uh, authorization verification. So even with WSR identity server, uh, you can use uh, both of these mechanisms too. So this is pretty much everything I wanted to discuss about the authentication, authorization, use management, and how to implement these things and incorporate these things into your API management solution. So if I wind up, right, so even this event, most of the time we discuss that nowadays we have to build the system. So if you want to implement a unique uh, solution, no longer we can buy things. We have to even, maybe even if we bought something, we have to build some uniqueness on top of this. Right? So when we're building things, these API platforms, the API management are really important. So the API management is not just the, let's say, the managing tokens or threat protections. Uh, identity and access management also play, play a key role there. So in this session, I discuss uh, several best practices you can implement in your platform. So hope uh, in your future solutions, you will incorporate these things. And again, when we implement the security, we have to mainly think three things. One thing is the, the security, how you make your solution is more secure. Then you have to think about the usability implementing a security without the usability again not going to work then again when we add usability in the system you have to think about the privacy concerns too so try to balance the security usability and the privacy too in implementing these things okay thank you everyone for joining uh, this session so even if you have any questions or concerns Please come into our booth so we can have a chat and clarify things. Thank you.